afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU special lecture series. My name is Yong Sun Peg. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for Asian Business and also the Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. Today's program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, the benefactor of the Center for Asian Business. We are very grateful for the foundation's continued support for the last four years. This program is also sponsored by the LMU Center for International Business Education. LMU is one of the 15 universities in the nation that received the prestigious International Business Education grant, whose primary goal is to help improve global competitiveness of the US companies and industries. Today's webinar covers a very important and timely topic. As you all know, global cyber threat continues to increase at a rapid pace with a rising number of data breaches every year. As information technology has become critical in competing in the global market, it is imperative that governments as well as companies should be proactive to protect the data. In recent months, Russia and China have been accused of their attack on cybersecurity in the US. The US-China dispute over technology and data security issues have already involved the leading Chinese companies such as Huawei, TikTok, and WeChat. Cyber attackers have been targeted. They even targeted the supply chain needed to deliver COVID-19 vaccines. The hackers are trying to disrupt or steal information about the vital processes to keep vaccines cold as they travel from factories to hospitals. Today, we are very fortunate to have three experts who can educate us about this important topic and share their insights and experiences with us. At this point, I'd like to introduce our moderator of the panel discussion, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Merida Shabaf. He's an adjunct professor in the Department of Information Systems and Business Analytics, LMU College of Business Administration. He has also taught at several Cal State universities, including Dominguez Hill, Northridge, Long Beach, and Los Angeles campuses. He has more than 25 years experience in industry and academia focusing on information security, network security, wireless security, cybersecurity awareness, system integration, re-engineering cybersecurity processing, hardware infrastructure, etc. He has designed information technology, conducted systems level security trade studies, and involved in consulting and research on these topics. He spent more than 10 years as a senior staff at Teledyne Electronics Technologies. At Teledyne, he received a corporate award for re-engineering information process within manufacturing environment to achieve business objectives. Dr. Shabaf, thank you for joining us today. Now, would you please introduce our panelists and start the conversation? You have to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Fake. Give me opportunity to uh, educate and raise awareness among the public. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to the distinguished guest speaker. Uh, we have Robert Cope, uh, which is a founder and principal of the uh, Joe Economics. And we also have a David Lockie, who is a professor at the RAND Corporation. Uh, and we would like to actually initiate your discussion about cybersecurity. Robert. Everyone, <laughs> going to the unmute there, yes. It's a discussion on cybersecurity where we're having some cyber challenges as it were. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to, to be speaking here. I thank uh, the Center for International Business Education at LMU in particular, where I uh, hope to be doing more uh, with on, on this topic going forward. I happen to uh, lecture at, at LMU as well, and I'm uh, very grateful uh, for the opportunity to be involved in the, the campus now in a, a broader context, along with uh, having someone like uh, Dave Lucky from Rand, who's, who's an even more in-depth expert on, on these topics and has looked at them for a number of years. 
I just wanted to give some of my uh, thoughts on cybersecurity and how to set the stage within the context of today's discussion. So I just thought very quickly, like I would at a lecture for a, a class of students, but, but with a, a broader uh, context in mind, start with the first principles of, for cybersecurity. So if you really look at it, we throw around the word a lot, cybersecurity, cyberspace, cybersphere, really comes from cybernetics. So here's a, you know, don't have to believe me. In fact, uh, the whole notion I think of when we talk about cybersecurity is verification. So showing one, my, my first principle is here verified by Merriam Webster, an authoritative source. Uh, and its uh, definition here is I think relevant to highlight just a couple of points. One is that it's, uh, it's you know, looks at cybernetics as the science of communication and control theory. And it's particularly related to control systems and, and even related to how those control systems uh, mimic a, and increasingly replicate aspects of the human nervous system. So if that's not uh, enough to instill more thoughts about what's going on with AI and, and what that means for control of society, as well as for facilitating society's uh, activities, which is how it works in, in its best use, where it's uh, less control and more just of the communication, but it has both elements there. So in light of the control aspects, I think that's one of the reasons we need to be very cognizant of the power of anything that happens to be cyber related, whatever we call it, originally called cybernetics. Now we like to speak of cyber space and then of course, specifically cybersecurity based on what we're addressing today. But also to just look at the origins of uh, cyber, that that idea comes from, or cybernetics from uh, cybernetes, which means to pilot or govern. So it, it automatically has within that concept of anything cyber, the notion that there is a certain amount of leadership required. I think for business leaders in particular, there's an increasing demand to, to think very seriously about what uh, cybersecurity and the whole uh, cybernetic cybersphere, cyberspace, whatever you wanna call it, uh, happens to entail. So just a, a couple of slides here to, to further illustrate my points. One is when you think about cybersecurity today, I, I use the terms on the title of this slide as cybersecurity in semi-practice, meaning it's not being fully practiced, right? And what I mean by that is think about data protection. Now, all of us to some degree must be relying on data protection. If you're not because you're, you're thinking of your own uh, computer and wanting to have antivirus software, I've given some illustration of leading antivirus programs available. So we all typically are you know, using those. And then if you work for a company, your IT department will have antiviral software installed. Increasingly, you see companies talking about uh, good uh, cybersecurity practices. But so often in business, it's relegated to the IT department, or as he's often referred to, that IT guy, right? The IT guy, he handles that. And it, it, it's one or, or several individuals who are in charge of cybersecurity and not a lot of thinking among the rank and file let alone among senior leadership. I think that's gonna be increasingly no longer possible in a truly globally competitive world. That doesn't mean everyone needs to become a cybersecurity expert, but they need to be much more aware of it and much more aware of it in a geopolitical context. And I, once we get underway with some of our uh, chatting with uh, David involved as well, I think we can delve deeper into that. But let me just illustrate a few more points in this regard. One is the reason I say it's semi-practice is there aren't many companies and, and many uh, businesses, even those already in the digital space actively, who truly think through all the ramifications of what's going on with this tectonic shift towards data becoming the basis of all socioeconomic activity. So it, you hear the buzzwords, right? Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution, the internet of things, 5G, the information age. So that's all going on, but, but it's happening in a way that that's sometimes imperceptible, but, but very real. So I've just got some illustrations there to uh, hammer home the point uh, the way Amazon is increasingly part of our lives. Uh, the Zoom conferencing, like we're doing now, the, the, if anything, COVID, the tragedy, the human tragedy of COVID has accelerated this move towards digital platforms. So whether it's having conferences like this or the way the iPhone and other smartphones, they have computing power that would have been housed in mainframe systems only a generation ago. So there's a lot of not just data, but the power of data at, at a very common level that's currently available. And that's brought about uh, controversies like we see with TikTok involving the US and China. 
And I, I have Tesla there illustrated, not just to show the movement towards uh, new energy vehicles, but ultimately the cars we sit in will be that. We're not gonna be driving them so much. Maybe we'll have that as an optional feature for fun, but they'll be fully automated. And they'll be like sitting in a mobile phone environment. So we're gonna be surrounded by data in ways we've we never thought possible only a few years ago. And uh, just a final slide here to illustrate how the geopolitics are uh, becoming more and more to the fore of things. Think of, uh, you know, so much we think of cybersecurity, oh, it's antivirus or, oh, it's, it's being hacked in a computer system that doesn't have anything to do with you, but actually it has to do with all of us. So one of the examples of that is uh, the, the notion of data integrity, not just cybersecurity in an abstract sense, but the fake news, a disinformation campaign that Russia perpetrated in 2016. And phenomenally, I mean, who would have believed me if I said five years ago, the White House of the United States would be actively involved in disinformation in an election cycle? Yeah, it was. Now, politics are politics, sure, but we, we're talking about active disinformation uh, and, and the whole notion of verifying news. In fact, one of the things uh, Dave and, and his uh, colleagues at Rand have done have looked at the whole notion of truth decay, and that's a fundamental issue going on and just the veracity of the information we have. So that's that's one aspect of cybersecurity that has huge geopolitical and even domestic political issues. And the, the final point I wanted to make is just on data espionage. And it's not just something happening with certain high tech firms that are attacked by uh, say Chinese or, or Russian, uh, either official or state backed actors. Uh, we had, for example, just in 2017, uh, nearly 150 million Americans had their personal data uh, hacked by the Chinese People's Liberation Army. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that and implications, but that's a lot of Americans. That's, that's basically one in two Americans almost have had already their information exposed to a foreign military. Uh, so this gets to the area of being a whole of society challenge. And there are lots of other illustrations of that, but that's one in particular. And also just to think of when we deal with China, which we need to deal with China, that's a business reality. China is the world's second largest economy. By some estimates, by 2030, it will be the largest, replacing the US as the largest economic power on the planet. Well, you have something like the 2017, also ironically, that same year that they hacked into nearly half of all Americans' data, uh, they passed a national intelligence law, which says specifically, uh, all organizations and citizens basically have to do whatever the state says in terms of espionage. So uh, that's the new reality. And that's why companies like TikTok, like WeChat, like Alibaba, even if they aren't currently actively engaged in espionage, which is an open question in some ways, I mean, and I'm not saying that they are that much of a direct threat like the PLA, but there's that potential. And the potential is built in because of something like the national intelligence law. So that that really illustrates, even by the wording of the law itself, what a whole of society threat means. So I'll just end with that. I just wanted to illustrate that when we talk about cybersecurity and geopolitics, they're actually merged in ways that many of us don't think of, I think, that uh, often. But in fact, that that's what's going on today. And that's going to become more and more of a thing uh, that we're going to have to deal with in business and in our daily lives. And I'll just end with that. Oh, uh, uh, Mirdad, I think you need to go off. You're muted. Just want to yeah. thank you again. Uh, that was a very good explanation about the geopolitical of the cybersecurity. As a matter of fact, today, I'm not sure if you heard the news, the North Korea. There are th exactly. There are three actually uh, indicted because of the, you know, uh, cryptocurrency one point three billion dollars uh, they hacked and they stole and these are the same group actually they did the Sony 2014 and they did the wanna cry ransom in UK hospitals yep. and as you see is a is a continuous process for that reason the cybersecurity has to be improved is like a continuous process thank absolutely. you absolutely so we're gonna move to David and we're gonna hear his point of view about cybersecurity. Thank you, Murdad, and thanks, Young Sun. And uh, I'd like to just thank LMU for having me. Um, this obviously is a critically important topic that will only grow in importance as time goes on. Uh, I'd like to start where Robert left off with the whole of society approach. And this is truly a whole of society, whole of nation, 
uh, the entire world is involved. And uh, this is the way I'd like to approach it. Um, you know, the federal government has responsibilities over our lives, but also uh, corporations have control of our, over our lives and employ the vast number of people in our country. And um, organizations being hacked and hacking come from both uh, government entities. Um, in this case, we're dealing primarily with Asia, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, all Asian nations, and uh, uh, from uh, terrorists and criminal elements, uh, individual criminal elements. So the, the problem is uh, on the um, um, uh, side of uh, who is doing hacking comes from all levels of society, from uh, nation states and major peer competitors of the United States uh, on down to other nation states, terrorists and individual criminals. On the receiving side, it's also a whole of nation, whole of government, global issue, because the hacking is not just of the US government that we're interested in or I'm interested in, um, but also uh, corporations, state, local, tribal, territorial entities. So uh, the, the issue is one of a whole of society on who's doing the hacking and also on who is being hacked. Um, and the approach that we need to take to protect ourselves or defend our society also needs to be taken with a whole of society or a whole of government approach. Uh, the second point I'd like to address um, following on from Robert's uh, excellent discussion is the data. Uh, the issue that we're talking about here, the challenges aren't with the systems necessarily, although there's a great focus on those systems. The main issue, the primary issue that I would suggest is the data integrity itself. That's what the systems are there for. The systems are just a vehicle to transmit, carry, and receive data. The data is what's the critical piece of this. It is the foundation of what we're talking about. So, um, uh, and the point I'd like to highlight in uh, the cybersecurity aspect of this, uh, um, in addition to being a professor of policy analysis at RAND, um, I'm also a senior international and defense researcher, and I uh, like to think of myself as a scholar practitioner. So I come at this from a practical perspective, more so than a theoretical perspective. And um, uh, the work that I've done is focusing on uh, the practical nature of cybersecurity. But one point I'd like to highlight um, from the corporate perspective is um, just several years ago in the C-suite of corporations, you had uh, the CEO, a COO, uh, perhaps, uh, a CIO, perhaps, for larger uh, corporations and companies. Now, in addition to just a chief information officer, we have a CISO, a CISO, chief information security officer, who in many cases is at a peer of the CIO. And so you have someone who is responsible for the information itself or the data and someone who's responsible for the security of those data. And, and that person is likely in corporations that have a CISO is likely a, a peer or a very close to being a peer of the chief information officer, him or herself. And so cybersecurity is an issue that uh, as Robert mentioned briefly, um, is critically important and will only grow in importance over time. That's the second point I'd like to make. Um, and the third and final point, I'll be very brief because I think the discussion is really what's uh, most interesting for everyone and uh, not just hearing me talk on the topic. But uh, the issue is one not just of outsiders, uh, nation states or terrorist organizations or individuals who are doing the hacking that, and, and that hacking involves both stealing information, uh, changing information, um, causing quest, causing uh, the information, the data itself to be questionable, um, uh, operating, uh, getting within our operate OT operational technology and information technology, um, because the operational technology, things that run electric power plants and nuclear power plants and electrical grids, uh, et cetera, those uh, systems are hackable and largely uh, targeted by others. Um, the the uh, data integrity in that regard is of a critical nature. Um, but so uh, the, the point I would like to make, uh, and this is the last point is, it's not just these outside entities that are responsible obviously directly for uh, hacking, uh, but there is also an insider threat. And, and that insider threat can be both witting 
espionage or uh, doing something for political reasons or for personal financial gain, but also unwitting. Uh, and that unwitting is my perception, that unwitting insider um, is perhaps even the greatest threat. Um, because um, folks that are unwitting insiders who perhaps had their uh, email accounts hacked and that was the entry point for the hacking to take place, um, they're uh, involved in the situation and don't even know that they're involved. So uh, uh, I'll just wrap up with one final point. Um, and basically where I started and where uh, Robert ended is on the whole of nation approach. Um, this issue uh, isn't just an issue for the United States government, which is largely where I do my work, um, but also an issue for United States corporations that the entities that generate wealth in the nation and, and employ our nation's population. Uh, and also from the federal level on down from a government perspective through state, local and tribal territorial uh, entities uh, and organizations uh, and not just law enforcement and county governments and state governments, but uh, as we've seen and heard, um, these things have to do with hospitals and public-private partnerships um, in critical infrastructure. Um, as I mentioned, a couple of the electric power grid, nuclear power plants, dams, water supplies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the financial sector and on and on. So I would just like to end there um, because again, I think the discussion is um, the most important piece of this. And thank you so much, uh, Murdad uh, and LMU for, for inviting me to the talk. You're welcome. I just wanna make a comment. Uh, the cybersecurity is not the IT responsibility anymore. It's the everyone responsibility in the society. So in a sense, uh, we are as an end user, we are the first layer of the defense. Let's put it this way. So if you don't get enough education, awareness about how I'm gonna use my device, you know, this is an iPhone, I'm doing my banking around my system, but I don't know how secure the system is, so that becomes part of end user vulnerabilities. So this is a, one of the key issues, which obviously I discussed in my model I created in uh, publication in 2014. And I analyzed it in 10 different dimension, how to actually increase the quality of the information security within organization. So uh, let me see if uh, there is a uh, questions in the queue so we can initiate our Q&A. If I don't see any Q&A, and I'm gonna actually uh, initiate my questions. As you know, last year, the US got uh, one of the biggest attack, governmental agency, and also the organization through the third vendor, which is the SolarWinds software package they installed it on many, many government agency. Now, we get to the point how we actually establish our policy in order to actually the sustain in this kind of environment, in attack environment. So I wanna hear your opinion about the strategy planning or the policy in regard to the uh, last year attack and also today attack, which is you know, the Korean, North Korean attack. So we're gonna actually start with maybe David, you wanna, or Robert? Sure, thank you. Yeah, great yeah. question. Um, yeah. Highlights many of the uh, critical aspects of, of what we uh, began our discussion with. And, and I'll be fairly brief on this and I'd like to go back and forth because again, I think the discussion is what's most important here. So uh, when uh, an organization is hacked, uh, I think there is an important aspect to determine uh, what information has been compromised, uh, how that hack took place through the system itself, the vehicle that was employed, uh, and then what um, uh, the perception is on why uh, the incident occurred. Um, one of the biggest challenges with this is um, uh, organizations um, in the federal government uh, either have been hacked or will be hacked, and the vast majority have already been hacked, but those that haven't certainly will be. Uh, and the same with companies, especially those companies in the def defense sector, but not just in the defense sector. Um, as I mentioned, the 16 areas of critical infrastructure are uh, also important. Um, and so uh, I would just like to throw this out uh, as a uh, a further a discussion point, um, and this touches on Murdad, what you said, uh, that um, every person is responsible, not just the CIO and CISO, uh, not just folks involved in physical or other types of security, but 
each person, each employee of an organization uh, is responsible for uh, being the first link uh, in that defense. And so I think that's what we need to focus on. Uh, again, this whole of nation, whole of government, whole of organization approach. Uh, Robert, over to you, and then, and then maybe we can just continue the dialogue. Sure, absolutely. And I, uh, not surprisingly, Dave offers great insights there, both in his opening remarks and in the response to Meredith's uh, question. And I just say what, what is interesting uh, to me among several topics that come to mind, but Murdad's comments uh, take me back a little bit to Stuxnet, which uh, people might not remember. And by, by no means am I saying, I, I'm not trying to create a false equivalency here and saying, well, you know, uh, the Russians do it and we do it, and which is true. We, we did hear uh, Stuxnet, for those who aren't following my, my point on that, is uh, the first real instance, it seems, of cyber warfare uh, perpetrated by uh, the United States in uh, conjunction with Israel against Iran's uh, nuclear program uh, using a similar technique where you, you uh, brought in a virus to some Siemens operating um, Me uh, mechanical uh, devices in uh, Iran's uh, nuclear uh, reactors. And for a very legitimate reason, and certainly as a very, um, you know, uh, concerned U.S. citizen about Iran's nuclear capabilities, I can understand why it was done. And it, it, it definitely set Iran back. Uh, in a similar vein, though, uh, what that did is it, as was feared, open a Pandora's box for other nations to then develop similar capabilities, which they have. And so now we see it here. So the genie is out of the bottle. Um, it isn't it, like any sort of weapon at all, actually. You know, weapons or um, hacking attempts, um, whether it's cyber warfare or cybersecurity, it's amoral, right? Amoral, I mean, it doesn't have morals. It's, it, it's, so a weapon can be used for good or ill. And uh, the same thing, uh, cybersecurity, kind of the points David is making there, it definitely can be uh, practiced well or uh, in a very lackadaisical fashion. And if it's done in this kind of, oh, someone else is taking care of it, you know, whether it's the CISO or, or the IT guy or, or someone else, uh, we're just exposing ourselves. And if anything, the instance that uh, Meridad referred to there just shows how it really is a global thing. It's happening everywhere. So we have to be vigilant. Um, you know, I certainly uh, support the idea that U.S. interests can fit with a global interest, as long as we're all on a common page that, you know, we aren't about uh, suppressing uh, people. We're, we're, we're for open markets, open societies. I mean, regardless of political orientation, I think we can all agree with that. And that, that's maybe another opportunity here for U.S. businesses and the government to also take a leadership position in, where we're, we're really making cybersecurity something more of we can all get involved, just as we should all have an interest in, you know, standing up against terrorism and for a, a general concept of human rights. I think if we maybe approach it that way, we can keep the genie uh, contained enough that it doesn't uh, create more disruption. Because we're, we're at, you know, back and David, I invite your comments on this, but I, I think as we get more and more digitized, it just exponentially increases the need to have that kind of cybersecurity awareness. Absolutely. And a um, point I'd like to make getting specifically to Murdad's question is on the supply chain hack. So one of the most uh, complicated, time-consuming uh, types of operations. Um, and I would just like to um, digress for a moment and say, uh, in uh, hacking that has taken place, um, and, and I'll focus for a moment at least now on the major nation state um, hacking that has taken place, uh, China and Russia versus the United States. Um, uh, those issues are largely fall in the realm of intelligence operations, hacking for nation state purposes, um, uh, shaping the environment, uh, you know, the military and defense landscape environments. Um, that's not what the supply chain hack is. And, and the issue and the challenge uh, with the supply chain hack is that it clearly brings in economics and corporations into the mix. Uh, one of the most, like I said, complicated and difficult long-term hacks to conduct. Um, and it just shows you, uh, the challenges show you the interconnectedness of society today. Um, parts uh, that go into production of 
uh, machines and systems in the United States or produced anywhere in the world for that matter are largely systems of systems. Um, it's unlikely that any organization has control over every piece of every complicated machine that gets built. And these supply chain hacks, again, bringing in the economic aspects of this outside the governmental realm and the, the, the financial issues that are raised, um, really call into question uh, the security again of those data and uh, what I would hope this doesn't cause, but I think is uh, very possible, is a retrenchment and uh, a perspective of needing to bring us back to an isolationist perspective. And we need to bring in, uh, we need to produce every aspect of everything that we make, which is uh, largely unachievable uh, in 2021. Uh, in 1950 or 1980, uh, perhaps. In 2021, uh, extremely unlikely. And so um, put, getting to your point, Robert, about putting perhaps a, a cap on the genie or holding the genie partially in the bottle, <laughs> if you will, um, uh, is the international community needs to develop norms and standards that apply uh, so that the entire global economy doesn't become victim to this. Because yeah. if these types of operations continue to be perpetrated, that's likely going to be, or it certainly is a possible outcome, which won't be good for anyone in the world. Um, I would hope that the global economy could continue to grow in advance and corporations would be um, uh, able to trust their supply chains in the parts and pieces of equipment that they're using to put together these systems of systems. So um, just a last point, again, uh, where I started, the supply chain hack um, really shows the whole of nation, whole of government, global aspect of this uh, very clearly. If I, I could tie in something that uh, Dave there was remarking on, which I think is definitely worth highlighting, and he, he, he did a good job of emphasizing, but to, to further illustrate, so supply chain uh, security generally is an issue. We've seen that with COVID, right? So it really drove home the idea that, hey, if all the N95 masks, which 3M happens to own the patents to, are still being made in China, and there were documented instances of those masks being blocked, it just illustrates at a, at a non-cyber level how this is a problem. Now, you relate to the, the more directly the cyber security dimension of things. Think of one of the reasons that Huawei has become such an issue globally uh, with the U.S. leading the charge, but now it seems even more than the U.S., uh, London and uh, Canberra and Australia and other nations uh, very much part of the movement to thwart is because of that concern that the 5G infrastructure, but that's essentially a supply chain uh, situation where the core infrastructure components are coming from a, a company which may not itself have any intention of doing anything wrong, but is bound by laws that say, look, if I tell you, you need to give me data on, on these people, or I, I want to use your systems, or uh, kind of to Dave's point about an unwitting employee, there could be a situation with a sort of unwitting uh, company, although, uh, you know, depending on the level of sophistication, but even if it was witting, it may not be all that willing, but brought into it under force of law. So the supply chain in the digital age, again, as, as we move from cars that are less mechanical and more electronic, and not only more electronic, but more interconnected. And, and even, I mean, I think I, I have a movable desk, which, which you, you, you know, although mine isn't that sophisticated, but there are ways you can program your home increasingly. I mean, the opportunities to hack into our lives uh, and it's across exactly what Dave was mentioning there, the supply chain. So it could be a single component, you know, and an and, and IC chip could be the uh, weak spot in that uh, chain. So that just shows the degree to which we need to really just get more educated and more proactive. And indeed, I've also fully endorsed the idea that, um, you know, if we can make it more of a collaborative thing, global supply chains you know, those who follow economics, there's nothing but economic arguments in favor of globalization. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter, though, of making sure it's on a fair, competitive basis and that we do have common rules. And that's what's been lacking. Very good. Good point. Now, in my opinion, it seems like we are moving toward a cyber war between the governments. And what do you think we, if the governments part of the United Nations established some sort of treaty. So in a sense, the government cannot attack to the other government through the cyber 
attack, like cybersecurity. Just like a, uh, for the nuclear bomb, there is a treaty between the government. So to, to, to manage or control of the, the, the nuclear bombs. So how about we could do the same thing for cybersecurity and agreement between the governments and or policy that can really attach to each other. What do you think about that? I'll start, Robert, if you don't mind, and turn it over to you. So please. Um, certainly, um, it's uh, my position, uh, Murdad, that would be uh, beneficial to the, the, the entire global population, what you suggested. Uh, I think the challenge, and I agree with it fully, uh, I think, however, the challenge is, again, as I mentioned, um, nation state to nation state hacking is perceived as an intelligence operation, which is legal by international laws and standards, and it's known that governments do this. Um, the issue, though, uh, is one that uh, I would just briefly uh, compare and contrast um, the United States perspective about intelligence operations with, for example, France's perspective perception about uh, intelligence operations. For France, uh, intelligence operations are only a basis or vehicle for economic benefit. Uh, whereas in the United States, uh, we've generally taken the position that we're not going to use intelligence operations for our own economic benefit. Now, I would also suggest China would uh, fall into the French camp uh, more so than the United States camp on that because it's my personal perspective that uh, much uh, of what China is doing is for economic purposes. Um, again, China does take a whole of government approach. And if I could speak about this for just this whole of government approach, you've heard me mention it several times. Um, it is something that I think is critically important and very much more difficult for the United States to understand and accept and do compared to, for example, China. China is a single entity from the uh, from Xi, the leader of China, all the way down to every person in China, they all fall under the same span of control. Um, they're a communist nation, obviously. Um, and uh, as was highlighted in Robert's talk, um, these companies have now, uh, they are legally obligated to support the communist regime. So every company in China now can be perceived as part of the government. Literally, they signed basically what we would call a, a non-disclosure agreement, a, 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 a charter a, a contract. They've signed a contract with the federal government of China. Uh, and so anything that China does, whether it had origins in intelligence or not, is now clearly economically based. In the United States, um, we have a very fragmented and disparate society. We, we perceive freedom and security very differently than does uh, the Chinese government and likely the Chinese person. Um, and uh, it's going to be very difficult for the United States to compete in that arena with a China that takes this whole of nation approach um, because we have a very, uh, a very uh, strict chasm and gap, if you will, between the government and corporations, uh, whereas in China, corporations are now literally part of the government. I'll stop there, turn it over to Robert, and uh, hopefully maybe back and forth this discussion, because this is one that is critically important. Robert? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead, Mirdad. Did you have something to say? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, well, just to... to uh, continue on from a point that David made about organizations. Another dimension to what's going on in China, of course, is not only that kind of, I, I thought it was well put to say that, you know, it's not only China. And I think in these discussions, you'd be very careful to say, this is not simply a China thing. China happens to be the second largest economy in the world. It happens to be the largest communist power in the world, although it's really a, a mixed system. But politically, it's not. Politically, it's, it's not old fashioned communism, it's updated communism, but anyway. It, there, there's a lot of complexities, and, and it's also worth pointing out, it's certainly not the only country to follow that kind of approach to uh, cyber espionage or other forms of espionage, as he points out. The French are, are very well adept to this, and I mentioned with Stutznik, uh, we're not, you know, th th there's, it's, it's hard to be black and white in certain dimensions. It's not 
to say you don't stand for the principles that we are purporting here. I think that gets to uh, the initial question there by Merdad of, in terms of that commonality. And I think that the challenge, put it this way, I do agree uh, with the idea that we, we need to go and, and try to approach some sort of common rules. That, that is what uh, brought about things like the WTO. That is what has allowed for globalization. That is what has allowed for economic prosperity, even if unevenly distributed. That's another thing we need to do uh, deal with domestically as well as internationally. But we have to look for commonality. And one of the key challenges, it's easy to talk about that, right? It's easy to talk about, it, especially with like, you know, the US and the UK or, or, you know, NAFTA, which is now the USMCA, we can talk easily with countries that share similar values to us. Uh, China is a real challenge because it has a different historical perspective. It also has what we're going to have to really address at some point is China has a sense of aggrievement. If you want to get a sense, if you want to get a, a perspective on what aggrievement politics look like, look at like what happened at the Capitol on January 6th. Now, that's just to show it's not limited to a country like China, but it's certain members of a society who feel have been left out, rightly or wrongly, get enraged and feel they can go above and beyond the law. China feels the world owes it for uh, basically the uh, demise of its imperial system in the 19th century, uh, really epitomized by the Opium War, which was truly egregious and, and uh, perpetuated by Western powers, not so much by the US, but certainly by the West uh, with Japan thrown in there. So China is still dealing with that sense of historical perspective. It justifies things like cyber espionage as well as IP theft for saying, well, I get the chance to now catch up because you've robbed me of my economic destiny. So I think if we start from that basis, not to say we accept those premises, but understand that's how they see it. And we, we're going to have to do that with regimes like Iran's and North Korea's and others too, if we want to really make cybersecurity across the board possible in a cohesive sense. Otherwise, we just have to keep best practices for ourselves, as, as Dave has made reference to. And we need to do that anyway. But if we want to get to this next level, kind of like Merdad's question was touching on, then that we really are going to have to go beyond just these incessant dialogues. We've had plenty of, you know, discussions around joint uh, interest, uh, mutual interest being supported by joint agreements and so forth. And, and we, we're going to have to address the root causes, I think, to really affect right. a, a sort of generally accepted principles of cybersecurity. Right. Now I'm going to go to if, if, God, there, if I could just... there are three questions. So we have a shortage of time too. So one question is, I'm just going to read it. Telegram app features secret chat is considered safe because it is encrypted end to end. Do you think that could be hacked? I'll defer to David on that with his knowledge of uh, cyber uh, protocols. Sure, I'll, I'll give a very brief uh, comment. Um, the short answer is yes, anything can be hacked. Um, and, and I think, um, let me just highlight that um, what we perceive as a cyber warfare today um, in the next generation of computing, whether that's quantum computing, optical computing, bio computing, some combination, um, how we perceive uh, cyber warfare today will dramatically change in the future with the um, uh, creation of these new technologies. Um, but uh, the short answer is yes, anything can be hacked. Uh, right. The question is how difficult and how likely is it? Yeah, that's a true statement. Thank you. The second question is, uh, do you think there is an existing universal organization that would enforce the common rules that would apply to all the countries involved in global collaborations? I guess that refers to that discussion we just had. So I don't think so. There is, in my opinion, there's a global collaboration in regard to cybersecurities. What do you think? I, I, I'd make one quick comment on that is, it's interesting if you look at, because Merdad in your, your comments, you also referred to the UN and there's the ITU, uh, International right. Telecommunications Union, which comes closest, but that's now mired in controversy because China has, while the US went isolationist and others didn't pay attention, China, along with the ITU and some other UN organizations has found a way to dominate those bodies. Uh, the WHO famously has, has become very much under China's influence. So yeah, I think we're just gonna have to start from scratch on that. I think, it, I think that's along the lines of something we need, but uh, I don't think there's anything close to having that role now. That's true, okay. 
Thank you. The next questions uh, have higher institution within China signed the whole of nation agreement. How will this impact the protection of the intellectual property? I don't think so. They did sign anything, but I, I want to hear your opinion about this. Well, I'll give a quick comment and I'd be interested in Dave's thoughts as well. But um, if by higher institutions, maybe is it missing the word educational institutions yeah. where there's been a, a, a horrendous uh, crackdown of, uh, on dissent? I mean, a very respected academics in economics and, and, and law, for example, uh, from prestigious universities have been removed to their positions. Uh, one of the few more um, critically thinking American academics who was based at a, a institution of higher learning in China was also removed from his post. So they've already had that. Yes, in fact, it's, it's to this level. It, it, it's, you know, we, have, we, we want to be very careful to got, not get too McCarthyite with this, but it is a bit like that. I mean, China, that, that's their playbook. That's, that's what she has chosen to do. China was moving in a direction of more and more reform and opening in a, a sense that we would all agree with, that it was truly opening up. And he's decided to send it back to the 1950s. So there are now communist cells at uh, universities in China. And uh, you have to be an active, uh, even if you're not a party member, which is increasingly expected now, but um, if, even if you're not a party member, you have to obey party rules. You have to go to party meetings. They have also come into companies. So it's not only institutes of higher learning, but like Tencent, which is considered one of the more open of the big tech companies in China, listed in Hong Kong, based in Shenzhen, even more freewheeling in some ways than Alibaba. Uh, they've got a communist party cell that, that's required to be put in there. I've heard some academics say, well, that's just pro forma. Well, it's not pro forma if they decide to tell you to do things, which they can, and that, that's the problem. So there's a degree of intrusion in everything from education to just commerce in China that is a truly astounding. Thank you. Uh, David, do you wanna add something to it or? Sure, just very briefly. Um, I, I'm not personally aware of any uh, required um, contracts between uh, institutions of higher learning in China and the Chinese government, similar to those of uh, that Robert mentioned, critically important, the, the, um, the required contracts between corporations and the Chinese government. But my personal perspective is that uh, I, would, I would lump them all together, unfortunately. And um, we know for a fact uh, that um, uh, Chinese academics have been sent around the world um, for intelligence operations. Uh, and so uh, my perspective is, uh, unfortunately, uh, in this regard, uh, I would lump them all together. Um, and uh, while there uh, are likely uh, folks in China who are um, perhaps uh, hold different perspectives, more views similar to uh, the rest of the world, um, uh, I think it's increasingly difficult for them to uh, maintain their independence. Very good, thank you. It's my pleasure actually to participate in this panel discussion. I really enjoy actually meeting you in the cyberspace. Uh, I'm gonna give a chance <laughs> to the Professor Paik because I have to join the another Zoom at 6 p.m. So <laughs> thank you very much, Guy. <clears throat> we keep in touch. <laughs> okay, thanks, Merdad. Thank you, Merdad. Uh, thanks, Merdad. Uh, serving as uh, the moderator. Uh, thanks, Robert and David, uh, for your stimulating conversation. To me, it was particularly interesting to listen to your conversation about how different states view cybersecurity issues in a different manner. Um, you know, obviously the Chinese that, that we know that often they play the you know, role of victim. So I think that the, even the technology, uh, the issues, why the theft of technology, they try to justify, you know, you guys are superpower. Uh, we are just the emerging nation. So I think it's only fair for you guys to give us uh, uh, more technology. And um, that's how they view, uh, right? The, uh, about this particular issue. So we have uh, about seven minutes left and uh, I don't see any more questions in the box. So as an organizer of this uh, the webinar, I, I like to use my prerogative to ask that a uh, couple of more questions before we wrap up this uh, webinar. So the first, 
Uh, I'd like to ask you the question, how do you view that the new Biden administration will handle cybersecurity issues differently from the former Trump administration? I know that the President Biden is strongly criticized the Russian government uh, for the recent malicious cyber attacks against the US government. So David, you focus a lot more, this is the what indeed the, um, uh, the war, cyber war between the states. So in that sense, do you see that um, any new role that the new administration will play, they'll be more aggressive or passive? Well, what is your prediction? Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, keeping politics out of this, this uh, to the extent possible. Um, we've seen the Biden administration name folks uh, early on to critical government posts. For example, just recently today, uh, and uh, this earlier this week, um, heads uh, and deputy heads of the uh, cyber security and uh, um, uh, cybersecurity infrastructure security agency have been named. Um, one of those is a presidentially appointed Senate confirmed position. So that's great to see that that um, nomination is co going forward. And then the deputy is uh, presidentially appointed, but not Senate confirmed. And uh, it looks like that person has been named also. So um, in that single regard, naming uh, the heads of an organization so early in the first 100 days um, uh, shows me that at least uh, the Biden administration is taking this uh, very seriously. Um, they have folks uh, installed on the National Security Council um, related to uh, cybersecurity. Um, so uh, my suggestion, I don't have any predictions, but my suggestion is that uh, the Biden administration is taking this uh, situation extremely uh, seriously. And, and let me just um, add one small point before uh, Robert jumps in, but I, I think uh, increasingly we're seeing that uh, cyber war or cyber operations, intelligence related cyber operations, call them what you will. Um, this is another example of the way that warfare is changing in our lifetime. Um, and, um, you know, we have now what's called war in the gray zone, and these are operations uh, done at the level below kinetic warfare. And, and I would suggest that is the future. I will predict that is more of the future um, because um, uh, powers other than the United States um, are benefiting from these uh, activities conducted in war in the gray zone. So it's not in their interest to actually engage in a kinetic war um, if they're being successful in their operations in war in the gray zone. So I'll, I'll stop there, Robert. As usual, great, great comments from Dave. I would, uh, I guess, further add in terms of Yongsun's uh, question about the Biden administration, I think there's reason to hope, if only for this uh, matter, because I think Dave has a far more astute understanding of kind of who the players are, the administrative functionaries and, and the responsibilities for uh, those departments. But um, getting back to some of what our discussion circled around, the future of cybersecurity, whether it's for businesses or governments at a global level, will be along the lines of some form of collaboration. Uh, and, and that really wasn't possible too much, I think you could argue under the previous administration. Regardless of one's politics, the previous administration very much made you know, it was, it was, it was, in fact, it, it continues to be uh, America first is, is their orientation. Now, I, that, I, I would support that insofar as we should really prioritize American interests. I think previous administrations, you could argue, maybe didn't do that enough, true. But if you really are, this is the, the conundrum of globalization. To, and, and Adam Smith first brought this to our attention. And it's amazing we're still grappling with it, but that for you to succeed as a nation, the, the wealth and prosperity of a nation very much depends on treating other nations well, <laughs> getting along, trade, that enriches every nation. So same thing with global cybersecurity. You can have an American first uh, orientation, but you have to engage bilater well, multilaterally, not just bilaterally, but multilaterally. So I think that bodes well given the administration's philosophy on international affairs, it's very different from the previous one. Okay, thank you. Actually, that one of my favorite colleagues, uh, Dr. Charles Vance, uh, he's a professor in management department. He said, it is not really a question, but he thinks it's an important point that we might be getting needlessly distracted, blaming cybersecurity violations on governments of China and Russia. 
people everywhere are possible perpetrators. About 10 years ago, an American lawyer in China indicated that most of his IP lawsuits involve Chinese against Chinese. <laughs> so what do you think about his comment? <laughs> Yeah, I'll go first if I could, Robert, and then turn it over to you, and sure. I'll try and be brief. I know we're near the top of the hour. Uh, as I stated, it's uh, the perpetrators of this. Uh, it's a whole. Uh, it's a global issue. It's not just nation states, um, and it's not just China and Russia uh, regarding nation states. Uh, but uh, there are uh, terrorists, uh, terrorist organizations, and individual criminal elements conducting uh, uh, cyber attacks on others. Um, so I. Clearly, it's not just Russia and China. And, and in my comments, I was just using China as an example of, of the types of activities that are taking place. Um, but clearly, there are cyber criminal activities taking place every minute of every day. Um, and so um, I think when we consider setting up standards, if, if we're able to do that, we need to consider not just nation state versus nation state, but individual versus individual as well. Robert? Okay. Yeah. So I, I would agree with this statement insofar as it's true. You can get distracted by, um, you know, vilifying it. First of all, I, I don't in any way support the idea of vilifying uh, China or certainly the Chinese people or Russia for that matter, although they're, they're, they're you know, usual uh, list of suspects. But I think it is different when you're talking about something like with the PLA having the 54th Research Institute, which is dedicated to, you know, cyber espionage in a very serious way that goes beyond the pale of what we would consider acceptable. That's an issue. And, and we're foolish to ignore that. Same thing with Russian state-sponsored hacking. Interference in the 2016 election was devastating, if only for setting a, a kind of precedent that was then perpetuated by domestic terrorists four years later. So that, that just shows some of the interconnections. Yes, we shouldn't vilify, but we should also be very aware of the uh, clear and present danger. Right. Uh, my last question. So far, we have mainly focused on the implications of cybersecurity issues for governments and corporations. Anybody at home, including all of us, could be vulnerable, right, to cyber attacks. How concerned should all of us at home be about our own personal data? Uh, I'll start. Um, you know, uh, be as concerned as you as you choose to be about your own personal data and and what sharing those data might mean. Um, Robert mentioned in his talk, it's been raised in this uh, about the the theft of uh, American PII uh, by. Uh, uh, likely a nation state actor. Um, and so um, my data is, is already uh, beyond my control, but uh, I would suggest uh, that notwithstanding, everybody should be concerned about their own data to the extent uh, they need to be to uh, protect their own personal identity and uh, medical information, legal information, financial information, et cetera, Robert. And I'd further wrap it in another way in terms of Jungson's question and the whole theme of geopolitics. Look, we need to even be looking at our own big tech companies because the way our personal data is being used, uh, when you really boil it down, really exceeds a lot of boundaries. And I, I'm encouraged by the fact we're having more of a robust debate as citizens and as a government. And we need, to, we need to look at places like the EU with GDPR and what they've done and maybe learn a bit from that. And practice good cybersecurity amongst ourselves, not even in a geopolitical context, but then use that as a basis for being more of an example on the global stage. I think that'll be better for our citizens and for our companies. Okay. Thank you again, Robert and David, for sharing your thoughts and insights with us about this timely and important topic today. I also would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in March on um, digital marketing. Until then, please stay safe and healthy. <laughs> Before you leave, I would appreciate it if you could complete the short survey at the end of this webinar. Once again, thank you so much for everyone. Good night.